All right, hello everyone, and welcome to season three, episode five of Star Trek Fenrir. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Fenrir is a tabletop role playing game that uses the Star Trek Adventures rule set. We're set in the year 2412 aboard a Cerberus class in the Sabine Expanse. You don't need to have watched previous episode episodes to enjoy this one, but you're probably gonna, you know, have a richer experience if you do. Should be the VODs for Fenrir on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. And uh, I think we're just going to go ahead and jump into introductions of everybody. So uh, let's start with you, Rast. Hello, uh, my name is John. I live in Seattle, Washington, and I play Rast, the uh, first officer, half Betazoid, half Romulan. And that is my introduction. <laughs> All right. Up next, we have uh, Lieutenant Zero. Uh, my name is James. I play Lieutenant Zero, the Android Chief Engineer. Uh, yeah, let's have a good game. Watney? I'm Watney. I play Captain slash Commodore Brie Archuleta, uh, and I also play the Denobulan Doctor, LL. Dag? I'm Dag. I play Fenrir's holographic Vulcan science officer, uh, one of two, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at TrekNexus. And then Mr. Williams. Hey guys, I'm Aaron. I play RJ Williams, Fenrir's Chief of Security, and Ensign slash Lieutenant Jensen. And last but not least, we have Matthew. Hello everyone, I'm Matthew. I play the Fenrir's other science officer, Lieutenant Commander Lee Tobin, a Bajoran. And uh, I also play Lieutenant Cartwright, a uh, Hydran security officer. Very good. And uh, one thing before I run the intro tonight, uh, I would say that tonight we are exploring religion in the context of Star Trek. Uh, it is sort of our intention to not be preachy or otherwise say this faith is right or this faith is wrong. We're not doing that. We're just exploring what religion means in the context of Star Trek. So there's your warning. Uh, but with that, uh, let's go ahead and run the intro. Alrighty, welcome back. So if you are new here, something I like doing is having the players do an opening log. And tonight, we are going to have one from Vassar. So as I uh, switch views here, uh, Vassar, if you would care to take it away. Waiting for a game to launch. <laughs> okay, seriously though, this isn't... This is taking forever. I'm really sorry, everybody. Aha! <clears throat> Vassar's personal log, stardate 89431.9. I find myself preoccupied with the entities known as Us and Tim. While we witnessed the emergence of Us, they have recently disembarked the ship to explore themselves in what they undoubtedly see as reality at large. Tim, a sentient construct, willingly relinquished its existence once it was able to ensure the survival of those synthetics over which it had been vigilant for thousands of years. As an artificial life form myself, I find a certain sense of 
satisfaction having shared the presence of these new forms of life. In their absence, I find myself lacking a certain sense of connection. Living among my organic comrades used to be a novel experience. I have turned to meditation to reconcile this dissonance. In addition to that, our current mission parameters seem to be providing a sense of fulfillment for my more existential contentions. Fenrir is currently en route to Ashgrave 4, also known as Footfall, on a diplomatic mission. The neutral planet attracts many pilgrims among multifarious species and faiths. It is regarded as a holy place, and Starfleet is preparing us to, among other things, mitigate offense. Our mission parameters concern a local governor who has asked for the Federation's aid in apprehending a militant group implicated in several acts of vandalism. While a member of the diplomatic corps might be more effective, it has been suggested that the presence of the Commodore's flagship might deter criminal activity during the investigation. Given our destination, Fenrir has seen an increase in discussions of faith. Many religious members among the crew have requested shore leave upon our arrival. I look forward to entertaining these discussions at the conclusion of our mission. End log. All right, thank you for that. All right, and our first scene is going to be in the science lab where uh, Rast and Lee are more or less uh, going over the last bit of data on a science experiment involving uh, EPS power relays and uh, other things I'll let them describe. Helps if I unmute. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> Not a problem, Commander. Uh, I must admit that the problems that we've been having with the EPS power systems on board the ship should be addressed by this new uh, kind of anticoagulant for the plasma coils. If we inject this into the warp engines, provided that uh, Lieutenant Zero agrees, we should be able to prevent any kind of, uh, I don't know, gumming up of the works, as it were. Is there any way we can also go through and just make sure that anything we brought with us from Andromeda is cleared out of this ship once and for all. Seems like everything that we brought with us from there has caused us issue. I, I must admit, Commander, I, I share the sentiment, but uh, I think that really is something you'd have to take up with Lieutenant Zero. He seems to think that many of the upgrades that were installed to the EPS power systems have been beneficial to the ship's functions. All right, well, next time it fails because of that, I'll make sure to launch an I told you so at him. Blame where blame is due, I suppose, Commander. So have you ever been to uh, our destination? Uh, no, actually, I'm not particularly familiar with Ashgrave 4. It doesn't hold any particular significance to the Bajoran religion, at least insofar as our sacred texts tell us. Tell me a little bit about your profits, is it? Uh, yes, well, um, I must admit that I have something of a heterodox perspective on the prophets relative to most of my people. Uh, given my training in earth philosophy, I've come to view them as something akin to Aristotle's prime mover, entities that really are one gestalt being that exist outside of time and provide a, a metaphysical basis for all reality. Um, they have guided the Bajoran people and paid special attention to us as a kind of extension of their grace. Well, our, uh, well, what little I do know of Romulan religion is uh, based, the most common is based on just worship of the elements. Hmm. So believed to have protective powers and people pray to them for good fortune. In a lot of cases, I feel that People make their own fortune, um, but um, I can see a certain element in uh, a certain element that makes uh, people more comfortable. Um, your people, on a on a different note, uh, have a very unique experience since you've actually encountered and experienced your deity. That is a great comfort to us. We have physical instantiations of the prophet's presence with us in the form of the orbs. Um, things like ancestor worship or personification of the elements, well, 
seems to rather pale in comparison. Although I do recognize that such things can be a great comfort. It's well, it's nice to believe that you have something out there that's looking out for you or something that's guiding your path and giving structure and meaning to your life. Um, humans seem to have taken more of a shotgun approach to their uh, religion, um, kind of just throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks. They are a rather interesting species. Um, I suppose that their diversity is a great strength, the diversity of their philosophies, their perspectives on everything from the universe to divinity. But one of the major purposes of religion is unification, unification around a shared set of ideals and beliefs. And well, the diversity of the Federation is brought into focus by that kind of unity. All of us working towards common cause. I guess that's part of the reason humans can fit in so well. They've been used to so much diversity within themselves. It made it, made it easy for them to accept the diversity of others, I assume. Mm. The sad fact, though, is that looking at their history, the opposite has been true. And it's easy to forget that in light of how far they've come in such a short period of time. It is commendable that they've been able to put aside a lot of those old differences. On a more personal note, though, Commander, if you don't mind my asking, um, speaking about unification of differences, uh, there's some scuttlebutt going around about you and uh, Lieutenant Alel. Any truth to that, or? In what manner? Well, uh, <laughs> he, he looks confused. There was the matter of the gift that you gave her and the way in which you signed I gave, it. I gave gifts to everyone. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> Lee would actually know that his gift was say, signed the same exact way. Oh, yes. So, yeah, it was just, you know, uh, everybody calls me XO, so that's how I signed it. Okay. You, you uh, Are you aware of the, the significance of those letters in a human context? Um, no, it never made, really made a lot of sense that uh, executive officer was not EO. Uh, instead, they went with XO. Mm. Uh, you might want to look that up in the uh, Terran cultural database because, well, I don't think that uh, most of the senior officers had any kind of misunderstanding about your intended meaning. Considering that you gave a gift to somebody who is not a member of the senior staff, she might? I don't know. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have given her a gift, but she has been very understanding and very helpful to me. Uh, I bring it up, Commander, because I have a, a question for you. Um, Starfleet regulations regarding fraternization between crew members are, well, fairly laxed. But I was wondering if... Are you was... interested in someone, Lee? Uh, not anyone in particular, Commander, but after spending a few days with Tim and seeing what they were willing to do for functionally their own children. I guess uh, I'm just feeling a little old and there are things in my life that I want to pursue before it's too late. Children. Yes. I realized after Tim that I need to have children. I keep, I, I, anyways, yeah. I was... I was surprisingly moved by uh, the actions of Tim. Yeah. As was I, Commander. But I'm sure that <coughs> there is. Um, well, I mean, what does what do the Bajorans think of mixing? Uh, with others, how, how do you feel about mixing with other races? Oh, uh, we have no particular concerns. There are some genetic abnormalities that 
might result and have to be taken into account, but um, there are no particular issues pertaining to interspecies relationships. Sorry, I swallowed something down the wrong way. <laughs> Golly. Oh, so has anyone caught your attention at all? Not as of yet, uh, but um, I suppose I'm just thinking about, well, thinking about that sort of thing. Well, discipline and those types of things tend to be, um, the captain seems to be more than willing to allow me to deal with that kind of thing. And speaking on behalf of the captain, I don't think she would mind some of her staff having meaningful relationships. All right. Well, uh, thank you for the confirmation, Commander. I didn't want to pursue anything before I had your blessing. Oh, by all means. And uh, in a rare show of like support, he'll like uh, uh, kind of grab a hold of Lee's uh, shoulder and give him a squeeze. And uh, Lee would return the gesture by patting the commander on the shoulder. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. We shift away from the science lab to a set of corridors where uh, we have Mr. Williams and Mr. Vassar. You're tracking down a rather unusual quarry within the corridors. And I'll let you guys take it from there. So I find it very interesting that crew access to the Terran cultural database regarding affectations has skyrocketed over 3,000% in the last week. Really? Indeed. It seems the term XO means many different things over the centuries. <laughs> well, one stands out. Speaking of standing out, our quarry does not do so. It seems to be emitting some kind of pheromone that locks itself from being detected by the internal sensors. Well, we'll have to uh, pick up our visual scanning and remind me again who signed off on letting Zeke keep a, a dinosaur? That particular record is not on file in the Fenrir database. All right. I'm, I swear, I'm not, I'm not animal control. I'm not an animal control officer. I'm not, I'm not here to rescue kittens from trees or, well, you know what? I would rescue a kitten from a tree, but I'm not here to wrestle a Dilophosaurus from a Jeffrey's tube. Uh, that seems hardly fitting. We are not chasing a Dilophosaurus. We are chasing something much closer to a Velociraptor or Deinonychus. Yeah, okay. You're, you're right. You're right. Forgive me the, forgive me the hyperbole, Commander. I just... A little frustrated that every few weeks it seems like this, what does he call it? The dinosaur's designation is Yvette, from what right. I understand. Every so often, Yvette <laughs> finds some way to work a panel, or I don't know if, can it, can it now talk and have access to security overrides? Because it just seems like Every two or three weeks, I'm searching this ship from stem to stern, just hoping that the next time I go into a Jeffrey ship, I don't get bit on my ass again by a dinosaur. I would like to hope the Universal Translator is working on a translation matrix. If I may... You're, uh, you know, you're walking the corridors, you know, you're scanning, and uh, as you do, I'm going to spend two threat that, uh, Williams, as you pass one of the yeah. doorways, the door opens, and inside is the Velociraptor-like Yvette, and you get maybe just a split glance out of the side of your eye, out of the corner of your eyes as you go, well, shit. No, <laughs> no, no, I've, I've got it. Clever girl. <laughs> just... But uh, yeah, she is actually going to leap at you, and I need you to roll me a daring and a security oh difficulty of one, please. Very well. And you would have a focus. Excellent. Thank you. Daring. And this is how I get the players to get momentum by throwing velociraptors at them. 
All right. One success. Yeah. One's all you need. Uh, you could describe how you uh, subdue Yvette. Uh, you know, we'll say Yvette only comes up to, we'll say, about thigh height. Uh, and so as she lunges, Williams does a, a sort of clumsy sidestep and just grabs her at the at the flanks and sort of picks her up and is holding him in front of her and her legs are like slashing and kicking and it's just like snarling, but he just is holding her way out ahead of him and she just can't get any purchase for her razor sharp claws or teeth. And he's just going to look at Vassar and go, you know, I'm getting pretty good at this. Indeed. If you wait just one moment, I will be able to put a communicator badge on Yvette, and we will be able to transport her back to Zeke's quarters. All right. Sure enough, you know, you slap the badge on, transporter goes off, and uh, you are blissfully now dinosaur free. Perfect. Hold that thought, Lieutenant Commander. I'm going to slap my comm badge and go. Williams to Zeke. Ah, uh, I'm so sorry. There's interference. Zeke, you're you're going. I can hear it. It's your voice. Just let me. Uh, I'm gonna say one thing, and then I'm gonna close the channel. This is the last time that I'm gonna tell you. Manual locks on the doors. Understood, sir. All right. She's she's really she's she's a really nice dinosaur. Ow! Oh, stop biting me! I, I gotta go, Commander. <laughs> you slap my gun badge. Perhaps we should have one of the medical staff outfit Yvette with a transport enhancer. Maybe, or we could just put a bell on her. You would the have thought to of uh, that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The fear that would spread throughout the ship on pawn jingling would be tantamount to negative conditioning, I would think. I mean, yeah, it's sort of like a like a, a weird inversion of Pavlov's dog. But for the crew, it may increase readiness for emergency drills. We could have event drills. I could run up and down the corridors with a bell. Hmm. Lieutenant Jensen may find it difficult to answer doors afterwards. You say that like it's a bad thing. Here it is. So regarding Fenrir's current mission, if I may change the subject. Please. What are your what are what are your expectations for this mission? Honestly, I I can't see any trouble breaking out with Fenrir on station. We're too well armed, and maybe this isn't the greatest thing, but we're too imposing. I feel like we could do a lot to help stabilization on the planet, but I am going to recommend that uh, crew members who wish to be mad to the planet take extra precautions. Hmm. It dawns on me that we have a separate quarry on that planet to keep from interfering with the festivities. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Yvette may be useful in tracking them down as well. Yeah. That was a joke, Commander. You scare me sometimes. You really, really do. I can never, I, 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 I never know when you're joking. I will endeavor to get better at my poker face. No, your, your poker face is exactly the problem you have. That's why I don't play poker with you. So I can't tell when you're bluffing. Bluffing is not in my nature. See, that's a, that's a good bluff. Thank you. So what, uh, are you going to be taking in any, any of the festivities? I believe it would mark a good opportunity to observe. 
just observe. Oh, I may sure. interject. Uh, Vassar, you get a chirp on your communicator. This is Lieutenant Commander Vassar. Hi, honey. Are we still doing the whole footfall ceremony thing? Yes. You can be assured my presence is not voluntary. There's a pause <laughs> where both GM and what? Archer alike are processing that. And she finally just... says, What? Did you just turn me down for a date? No, I was joking, as you have asked me to do more frequently. Okay, honey, we need to work on your sense of humor. Is, is Williams there with you? Yes. Williams, you can hear this, right? Acknowledged. Teach Vassar some humor, or get zero to just... I've tried. I can only do so much. That's a, that's a tall order, Miss Archer, but I will take it on with due gravity. Thanks, Williams. See you later, Vassar. Calm turns off. So? How's that going? It has been a most fascinating experience. Very Vulcan thing to say. Thank you. <clears throat> I do not feel comfortable sharing the more carnal details. However, it is proving to be a wonderful data gathering resource. Thank you. That's, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, but, I, you know, relationships, connection, it's about more than gathering data. It's about the way you feel about each other. It's about the way you think about her when she's not around. You know? As I experience certain sensory input patterns, I become accustomed to them, and I do miss hers when they are absent. Well, he just sort of slap Vassar on the shoulder. Well, there's, there's hope for you yet. Have you ever dated an Undine, sir? Not to my knowledge. Then you may see why my data gathering is so important. Uh, absolutely, from a from an anthropological sense, Precisely. it could prove to be a, a remarkable glimpse into their culture. Now that we have found and returned Yvette to her designated domicile, shall we return to the bridge? I think so. We're not off shift for another hour and a half, so can't really knock off early just yet. Very good, right. sir. With that, we're going to cut to the ready room where Commodore Archuleta, you are going over the last of the reports coming from your fleet, and uh, you have a moment to talk with each of the captains if you so wish. <clears throat> All right, Captain John. All right, let's get him up here as soon as I find what I did with his token. Uh, there he is. So our lovely score friend appears on your computer terminal and says, Yes, Commodore, what is it? Um, I wanted to first and foremost thank you for your assistance with yes, me. Yes, yes, I'm your whipping boy. What of it? <laughs> uh, okay, then I'll just get straight to it. Um, how was the M-Class planet? Boring. Nothing more to report? Not really. Everything that uh, you need to know is in my report. I mean, what's there to talk about? And you probably by this point knows that he's just making, you know, he's trying to save face, but he really doesn't want to be here. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I'll send along your next mission. Mm. That'll be all. One quick thing, Commodore, the next time you tell me to go deal with a rogue computer, maybe don't send a hospital ship, maybe send an engineering vessel. Just a just a friendly word of advice. Mm, thanks for the advice. If I had had the intel, I surely wouldn't have sent you. Mm. And yeah, he cuts communication before you can. 
Um, we'll do the Betazoid. Betazoid, I'm Mr. I'm on T. And uh, in a stark contrast to the last person to appear on your view, view screen, uh, I'm on T is very upbeat. And he says, hi, Commodore. What can I do for you? Hi. Um, well, <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to be so pleasant right off the bat there. Um, anyway, how was your, uh, the Azeth ship? Did you manage to help them out? Yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't really anything major. Uh, there was a problem with their EPS conduits. Seems to be a lot of that going around recently, if I do say so, Commodore. Uh, I didn't think much of it at first, you know, of course, as we're replacing the conduits. Uh, we start to get to talking, and apparently uh, it's not just the Azeth who are having EPS problems. I'm hearing things about Ferengi free traders. I'm, I'm hearing things about... Uh, sort of mercenaries and free, uh, you know, sort of operators in the Sabine Expanse. Everybody seems to be having EPS problems, and I don't know why. Noted. Um, send me the full report on that, and we'll cross-reference here with our engineering. I'll see if I can get more from the other ships, too. Yes, Commodore. Is there anything else I could do for you? No, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in T out. And, you know, ends communication in a civil way. And then Captain Vinleth. All right. So Vinleth actually is not as perky as she usually is. Uh, she uh, seems a little bit uh, sleep deprived. There are bags under her eyes. Uh, her voice isn't as upbeat as usual, but she still makes an attempt. She says, oh, uh, Commodore, I, I assume you want to hear about the Missouri. Yes, I would, um, just anything additional to report, but first, are you all right? <sighs> Not really, no. I haven't been sleeping well recently, but uh, nothing alarming. I, I have the CMO of the ship working on it. Uh, something about uh, my uh, sleep cycle being uh, unsynced or something to that effect. Is... Uh... Is that normal for for, for Serato Draco? For Cer Serato Draco? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it happens, but not usually as long as this. Uh, she sort of rubs her eyes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you're you're probably calling about the Missouri. Sorry. Um. So I have good news and bad news. Which would you like first, Commodore? Um, we'll take the bad news. Bad news is, uh, based on what we've found so far, I, I think it's safe to say that the Missouri has gone missing with all hands. I was afraid you were going to say that. Well, the old Miranda classes just... I don't know. Something's off about it. Well, we were able to... That's the good news, is that we were able to record... Uh, or recover, sorry... We were able to uh, recover a data wafer from, or a data check. God, I really need some sleep. We we recovered some data, Commodore. And what we found was that they were running some new experiment with their EPS conduits. I, I don't know what it means, but I'd be happy to forward the data. Yes. Um. Hold off on forwarding that for now. I'll reach out if I require it. I will, but I need to get some things in order first um make sure you know that you can take some time off the bridge and don't be afraid to let your exo take command for a while you know what that is the best idea i have heard i think i'm gonna let uh mr jefferson take over for a little bit good well give him my regards and Will take do. care and without. So Bree's going to kind of pace around the ready room for a bit. Um, and then she'll tap her badge. Uh, this is the captain to zero. This is zero, captain. Uh, talk to me about our our conduits, our EPS conduits. 
at this time using the modifications that myself and Lieutenant Commander Lee implemented. At this time, the rogue conduit is working at less than desirable efficiency. However, it is more productive than as it was beforehand. Um, I'm currently awaiting the results from Commander Rast and Lieutenant Commander Lee regarding their current experimentation on the fluidity of the uh, stuff that goes into the warp core. <laughs> the stuff. Technical term. Zero, Zero, are you feeling all right? Um, it seems that with the current EPS issues that have been reported among our ship, along with several others reading engineering documents, it may have also affected my recharging cycle, possibly. Interesting. All right. And that's the only conduit that's had issues so far. As of this time, that was the most severe conduit. So it was the one most closely looked at. Um, during beta shift, they are going to be going over a full engineering schematic to ensure um, current numbers are efficient for the rest of the conduits. Right, yeah, run a full diagnostic and uh, send me and Lee the report. Will do, Commodore. Thank you. And right on cue, you get a chime uh, that you're expected on the bridge, Commodore. Be right there. Right. She leaves. So we step out onto the bridge where most everybody but Zero is there at your stations. And on the view screen is the scenic vista of Ashgrave 4. And uh, Williams, you're seeing that there's an incoming hail from the planet. Coming hail from Ashgrave 4, Captain. On screen. Appearing on screen is a African-American uh, commander in Starfleet Blue. Uh, you know them as Commander Idra Chahal. You could just call her Chahal. Um, but she looks uh, actually uh, sort of... If Vinleth was sleep deprived and Iman T was upbeat, just somewhere in the middle is where I would put Chahal. Uh, but Chahal says... Uh, Hello, Commodore. We are happy to see you. Uh, was your journey pleasant? It was. Um, we're glad to be here. Yes, yes. I uh, I do apologize for uh, bringing a vessel such as yours, an important vessel such as yours, to such a minor uh, inconvenience, but uh, it is somewhat important, I feel. Oh, it's not a problem. We're in the area. Well, uh, I would be happy to uh, meet you in person, or if you would prefer to uh, get to business, I could simply tell you now what uh, the situation is. It's really at your discretion, Commodore. Um, I would love to meet in person, but I am concerned. You seem... Are you feeling well? I'm fine, yes. Um, tell me, Commodore, are you a uh, religious woman? I'm more spiritual. Would your beliefs include demons in them? They do not. Well, I'm starting to think that some of those faiths that do include demons might be onto something. All right. Um, why don't you um, come aboard? We can talk more. Yes, sir. And uh, communication goes off, and you are just left with the uh, green and brown and blue planet on the view screen. Uh, Bree will look to Rast to see if he picked anything up on his radar. Yeah, Rast, that would be a... Go ahead. Uh, do an insight and a command difficulty of two. Okay. Oh, dang it. Hate when windows close by accident. Uh, 
All right. Uh, insight command? Yep. Hey, two successes. So you got the sense from Chahal that she's definitely hiding something, or she at least has a lot more that could be said. Um, but what you're not expecting when you reach out with your mind is that, again, there's a planet and a ship that you're somewhat attuned to, at least one of those. When you reach out with your mind, it's almost as if all those minds try to connect to you at once. And, of course, you're able to handle it just fine, but it's almost like you're hearing hundreds of different voices in your head at once. And it's only there for like a split fraction of a second before you return to whatever your normal, quote unquote, is. Uh, he holds his head for a moment. <sighs> I don't think she's telling you everything, um, but there's also s just something odd with the area. It was almost, it was almost like being in a room full of children trying to get your attention at one time. All right. Um, I'm sorry Commander... if that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it's helpful. Um, who's in charge of sensors on the bridge right now? Uh, either Lee or Vassar. Okay. Um, Lieutenant Commander Lee, yes, would Captain. you mind running a full sensor sweep of the area? Of course. All right. And, That's going to uh, be a uh, reason science. And uh, let's see, ship will assist you with a sensor science. Uh, difficulty of zero. Okay. And I will use augmented ability uh, reason for that. Okay. Hey, look at that. That is uh, four successes. Very nice. Uh, so I'm going to give you a handout on Ashgrave 4. It's a bit of a meaty one, but uh, it probably has everything you're looking for. And, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. What would our momentum be at? Uh, you should be at five by my count. And as the data is coming in, I would forward that immediately to Vassar so that he could examine it at the same time. All right, let me get Vassar on the handout. There you go, Vassar. So that's the Ashgrave uh, for Starfleet Database handout? Mm hmm Okay. Of course, as they, as they read, elevator music plays. Nice soothing music. Well, as uh, Vassar continues to examine some of the uh, historiographic data on the world, I can tell you this, Captain. It seems that there have been an inordinate number of religious experiences recorded on the planet. As soon as Federation explorers landed on the world and began to explore it, a number of them began to report, well, inexplicable occurrences, visions, and the like. And many of them seem to have, well, to use a colloquial expression, found God because of it. They've begun to embrace various different religious traditions based on their experiences on the world. I have to say, Captain, that um, I'm reminded of an experience on, I believe the planet was Ventax 2, and he leans back for a moment, strokes his forehead, and thinks back. Um, there was a woman that was encountered by the Enterprise D who was posing as that world's analog to the devil. I believe her name was Ardra. And she manufactured through technological chicanery all manner of, I suppose, 
purportedly demonic occurrences in order to deceive the population and manipulate them. She was also able to take the form of the human goat-legged devil and the Fechlir from Klingon mythology. We might be encountering something similar here, but I don't want to speculate mm -hmm. any more than that. Thank you. And the previous religious experiences of the original explorers were nothing like what we're currently experiencing. Commander Vassar, your perspective on the synthesis of the data that you've been presented. It is quite fascinating. Um, there is no historical documentation to align with that speculation. However, it is not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, little investigation has been made into the source of such matters as the colony seems to have found a balance in its multi-denominational expression. Indeed, it seems as if there are no particular places of worship on the planet. Mm. Um, there are no land claims to be made by any individual group, and businesses can only trade in the main colonial hub. Thus, there is only one center of activity on the colony, the main colony town. The colony so there's, has... the population is isolated to a single area? Yes. There are 500 primary residents in the single colony with approximately 2,000 pilgrims that might visit daily. When, when was the colony established? How long ago? Shortly after Warp Drive was created by Zephram Cochran. So quite some time they would have had time to migrate. I wonder what's keeping them in the same area. Many of the people who are arduous in their faith believe that the creator once uh, resided on this world, and that is the source of their religious experiences. I see. And the history was helpful, but was there anything in the sensor logs about anything weird going on abnormal what what class planet is it m it is an m class planet however uh, scientific analysis of the planet has been impeded by the residents as they do not wish to explain scientifically what they feel from this world oh well we won't ask them to do that but if something is disturbing uh, what was her name? Chahal. Um, oh, Idra. Ah. Chahal. Um, then, and we'll have to get to the bottom to the bottom of it. Right. So let me ask this: uh, Who would be uh, meeting with Chahal? Would it be just you, Commodore? Uh, would it be the senior staff? I would invite the senior staff. Okay. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm going to put us on theater of the mind, uh, mostly because for the life of me, I can't find Chahal's token. So we'll just imagine for a little bit. I know, imagine, how dare we? All right. So uh, as I clean that up. All right. So uh, you all filter. <laughs> as you all filter into the briefing room, uh, Chahal is seen in uh, by Mr. Jensen. Mr. Jensen does not stay very long. He's just her escort. Uh, but as Chahal comes in, uh, you see that her uniform is actually very nicely pressed. Uh, you see that uh, she proudly wears the three pips, three gold pips of a commander. And uh, she looks a little bit, little, just a tiny little bit better than she did on the view screen. And uh, she sort of looks at the table... Uh, we'll sit where indicated and say, thank you for having me, Commodore. And um, I believe if I have studied the records correctly, you are Commander Rast? That is correct. And you are Lieutenant Zero, Lieutenant Commander Vassar, Commander Williams, and Lieutenant Commander Lee, correct? Indeed. 
Cool. All right. Uh, well, where to begin? Um, it started with, to put it plainly, a petty act of vandalism. Uh, just a few hooligans painting, you know, doomsaying methods on buildings in the main settlement. But then they started coming. They? What do you... <laughs> the demons that you've referred to previously. Yes, and I... To be blunt... I'm sort of an agnostic person. I don't particularly believe that there is a higher power here or that there's something like a grand plan, but to, again, to be blunt, when a seven-foot-tall red-horned being comes running at you, you start to question some things. You're saying you've had physical contact with some sort of demonic manifestation visible to multiple people yes uh, i actually brought a pad and uh, she pulls out her pad and flicks the uh, screen up and because you're on the fenrir uh the holographic emitters in the conference room come to life and above the table is in fact an image of a demon and sure enough you're looking at a about a two and a half meter tall uh bipedal creature uh, does have two legs, two arms, has a tail. Um, tail is spiked. Uh, there are curved horns that sort of come out to the side, then curve forward, almost like a bull's. Um, and its face is, to put it plainly, horrific. Um, it is terrifying. Uh, the eyes are like glowing cinders, and the mouth is a maw of nasty-looking teeth that looks like it could chew through anything. And uh, as this appears on the screen, she says, we've had about 60 or so sightings of these things. And though they haven't really attacked the settlement, uh, I honestly don't know what to do. Seems very unnerving. Um... Do, sorry, Commodore. Um, oh, go ahead. Are we aware of which religion throughout uh, the current known universe that this demon would be portrayed as. I know that several religions have different portrayals of demons. I didn't know if there was perhaps a specific one that would describe this. Uh, zero, why don't you roll me a insight and a science, please? Hmm, excuse me. Insight, science, difficulty of one. No, power systems is not going to apply here. Let's see if I have another focus, but I don't. Hey, you get a momentum. You are capped. Very nice. Uh, what you're seeing, Zero, is that there isn't a specific religion, but the longer you stare at this creature, the more you start to see elements of different religions. So, for example, maybe you're seeing that the horns are stylized after Klingon demons, and that perhaps the way the claws are structured or the talons at the end of the arms, those looks almost like a, a Gorn sort of being. So it's it's a amalgamation, a combination of different faiths is what this looks like. The reports of the demons, um, are they along the lines of a come and go like they'll see the demon then suddenly it's gone or have they been along the lines of people receiving injuries we haven't had any confrontation with them yet uh, it is definitely the former where they have just sort of it's a, they 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 sort of just appear Stand menacingly and then disappear, seemingly at whim. Do they you say anything? Logs. Oops, sorry, we had a bit of cross talk. Let's do Williams first. Please. Do they say anything? No, not in any language that we understand. 
Do your sensors have any transporter logs, life signs, or forensic evidence during those appearances? No, and that's the damnedest thing. Uh, there's no transporters that we can see. Uh, there's not any life signs either. Are you able to physically interact with them? Did they touch anybody, hurt anybody? There was a Klingon pilgrim. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Chakul? I think it was Chakul. Yes, yes, it was Chakul. Uh, Chakul said that the, the demons were his test to get into Stovacor, and he went to confront one with a, a Batleth, but by the time he got there, the demon had disappeared already. Uh, he isn't here anymore, as in he's left the planet, but uh, that's really the only confrontation I could think of. And uh, per Commander Vassar's question, do they leave behind any kind of physical signs of their having been present? For instance, a creature of this size and likely this mass would leave behind footprints or scratches of some kind. Have areas in which these creatures have appeared been investigated? Yes, and uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. No footprints in the sand, no residual particle streams, nothing. Is there a possibility that these images could be similar to a woman known as Adra who used hollow, pardon me, who used hollow projections to assume and appear catastrophic events, but also make herself appear as various known devils and demons? Trust me, that is one of the first things that we thought was happening, and we ran some very thorough tests, and best we can tell, no, we don't have an Audra here. Not necessarily the woman herself, but the implementation of hollow projection. Right, right, yeah. They're not holograms, but they're not life signs, and they don't leave a trace. That's what makes this whole situation very odd. Uh, talk to me about the vandalism. What did it look like? Do you have a picture? I do, yes. And uh, she shows you. And it's basically, it looks like graffiti you might find in an urban area. It literally is just sort of a, a doomsaying message of repent, the end is nigh, or we must all come together under one faith. You know, it's it's stereotypical sort of hooligan writing, really. Commander of the races currently inhabiting the planet, are there any who exhibit any sort of psychic affinity? There are some, yes, but they haven't reported anything odd. But then again, every telepathic or empathic person that comes to the planet, they do experience a sense of euphoria. Before the demons began appearing, has there been a cross-check regarding the arrival or departure of perhaps certain people or even uh, ecological changes such as massive temperature changes, a sort of large-scale uh, issue that could possibly excite maybe a more psychic uh, or a more psychic um, a more psychic response no we haven't detected anything odd like that no uh, well okay it's it's not quite what you were asking but there was a uh an organization that's sort of been growing in the recent times. Uh, they call themselves the Voice of Purity. And we think they're the ones behind this graffiti. But I don't know. We, we've had a lot of discussion on the planet about the Voice of Purity. I myself have tried to talk with them. But every time we've gone to their, uh, I guess you would call it commune, uh, they haven't been there. The place has been abandoned. Uh, but I guess since you're here, 
uh, you're welcome to check it out yourself and uh, see if you can find them. Is there a manifest on current um, census numbers of people of the different religious groups? Uh, yeah, we have that data. Would that also include the members of the voice or are they more secretive? I would say they are a bit more secretive. We don't have names. We do know their leader, uh, Anala is the name of their leader. But beyond that, we don't know their names. Don't take this the wrong way, but your planet gave me a telepathic headache when we first got here. That is understandable, but uh, what I'm told by my empathic and telepathic friends is that that feeling you experience immediately goes away if you step onto the planet. It only makes it far more concerning. Perhaps some view it as a sign that they're meant to be there. Well, the other thing we have to take into account is Commander Rast has had several treatments of I believe it was psychoglobin. Hello. Perhaps that may cause an yeah. That perhaps it has adjusted his abilities in some way. I honestly couldn't tell you. I'm unfortunately not telepathic or empathic myself, so I can't speak to that. How are you Commodore feeling now that you're on the ship? About the same as I usually do. Could go for a rack to Gino. Make sure you pick one up. You're welcome to stay here as long as you'd like. Thank you, Commodore. What were was you saying, there, RJ? Was there anything in particular that you would that you were uh, hesitant to share with us when you first spoke with us? That you wish to share now that you are with us? She thinks for a moment, rubs her chin, and says, No, I, th I think I've covered everything. I can't really think of anything I've admitted. Commander, is there a localization of these phenomena? Do they occur in roughly the same area, or is it spread over the entire settlement? And uh, she shows you a map of the settlement. And, Williams, I'd like you to roll me an insight and a security Difficulty of two. Okay. I'm also Maybe. going to be uh, trying to judge her uh, truthfulness on my question. All right. So Rast will be a insight and a command. Difficulty of two as well. Uh, anybody mind if I spend uh, some momentum for an extra d20? Go ahead. I am. I was going to ask if I could assist uh, Commander Williams by applying uh, the sensor readings for the geology of the region and the geography of the region. You certainly may. And uh, Vassar would assist with an insight science. Wow. Oh. Wow. All right. Well, even before the assist, that's five seconds. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> We're just smacking her around. <laughs> So I'm trying to figure out how much floating momentum you have here. Uh, <laughs> by my count, you have eight floating momentum. Does that include Vassar's success? Yes. So you're capped. You have eight floating momentum. So here's what you learn. The first thing that you learn is Rast, she's telling the truth, or at least what she believes to be the truth. But whether or not that's the same thing, you're not that much of an empath to tell. But you can tell she's being truthful, or at least trying to be. Um, as far as the sort of location for all of the um, demon sightings, there is an odd spot. And interestingly enough, it is the Voice of Purity's commune is where a majority of the sightings happen. Seems like a majority of the sightings of these demonic entities happen roughly around the Voice of Pure compound. Would... It's a very convenient corroboration of their message. Commodore, with your permission, uh, I'd like to send down... 
some security teams. I'd also like to ask Commanders Fassar and Lee to send down some science officers with scanning equipment to accompany them. If we have another instance of these demonic visitations, I want eyes on them. I want scanners on them. Understood. Uh, Commander, if I may, I did have one other question. You mentioned the, uh, the leader of this group is a woman named Anala, was it? Correct. Are you aware of her whereabouts, or is she likewise always In the absent? wind? Yes. yes. Hmm. And are you aware of her race? Uh, yes, she is human, last I knew. Captain, I would also uh, request to be sent down to the planet. With Very the well. Away team. It sounds like something is affecting the populace. Stay vigilant. I'll stay up here um, to make sure I'm unaffected. All right. So let's talk away, team. I've got Rast. I heard Vassar, I heard Lee, I heard Williams. I'm guessing Alel, question mark. Yes. And then Zero, are you coming as Zero or are you coming as a supporting character? Um, I'll go as Zero. Okay. Maybe so good. Uh, an an oh, sorry. Just no, go say, ahead. An android uh, that may not be affected by if there's any sort of psychic shenanigans. I think that uh, Lee will be staying behind, so I'll take uh, Cartwright. Lee will stay to man the sensors <gasps> yes. on board the, uh, the Fenra. All right, Mr. Cartwright. Excellent. All right. So we switch scenes, and you all beam down to an idyllic place. And to put it plainly, the environment you beam down is right out of a storybook. It is perhaps one of the most stunning sights that you have ever encountered in perhaps your entire life. It's that picturesque. And all of you, except Zero, experience a sense of calmness, a sense of happiness that you're able to be here and see this. It's uh, both humbling and inspiring all at the same time. Uh, you're seeing wide open canyons and spaces and clear skies. And it's, again, it is what people dream of going to see when they go on vacation kind of a thing. And were you not capped on momentum, you would have each gotten, except zero, one momentum. So you would have gotten five momentum. But since you're capped, nothing else happens. Does that include the hologram? Yes, yes, it does. Mm. Wait, so Vassar also got a feeling of serenity. Yep. Wow, this place is great. I can't tell if it's because I'm like due for my six day long sleep soon or not, but um, I just, uh, this place is great. What do you guys oh, it, think? It, it's absolutely delightful, I must say. Uh, the, the gods of this place must be eminently powerful never seen anything like it it is beginning to overwhelm my interfaces <laughs> i'm sure there are many other planets that have vistas comparable to this that remark is what i believe is called a buzzkill rast is going to try to do his best to fight off the feeling okay uh go ahead and roll me since eight. he since he kind of knew that he was going to be expecting uh quote unquote euphoria when he got here mm -hmm. uh roll me a control and a command difficulty of two i'll use a momentum as well okay <clears throat> Must admit, this vista is not what I expected based on the records aboard Fenrir. No, I can, with little to no mineral or agricultural worth, would not render such a beautiful place. I can understand completely just by looking at it why they don't want to leave the main settlement. Why despoil all of this? Yes, the majesty and grandeur of this entire place. It's so alien from my own world, given that it's 
really just one large cloud of methane. But um, this world, it's, it's absolutely delightful. Hmm. We broke RJ, John. You have to convince, you have to convince I was just, the captain. I was and... just thinking about how awful it would be to live on a planet that was just a cloud of methane. <laughs> RJ, Sorry. RJ, I mean, I mean, um, Commander Williams, you have to convince Captain to, um, or the Commodore to, uh, shore leave here. No, listen, well, it's fine. RJ's fine. We're all friends here. Um, I'm definitely, yeah, I may just retire to here. Um, hearing everybody talk, Zero's mm -hmm. gonna run a scan to check for, uh, emotional levels or like chem chemical levels okay uh roll me a reason medicine difficulty of two and while you're doing that i will say what rast got for his test so rast you of course fight against the feeling of euphoria the feeling of uh humbleness and basically in awe of your surroundings and it's actually rather trivial for you to push past that feeling and feel quote-unquote normal um but it doesn't change the environment around you. It's still just as impressive, but now you're not feeling perhaps the elation that you were initially. Um, you are also noticing, I'll give you this, you are noticing that there is uh, some mines, some group of mines to the west about a, a half a kilometer or kilometer. And they appear to be human, or at least they feel like humans, but you can't really get a, a solid beat on them. You just know that they're to the west somewhere. We should head about half a click west. I'm getting a sense of, uh, of a presence there. And let's all try to focus. Um... Difficulty for me? I don't think Difficulty two. Okay. Mm, experimental medicine? Nah. All right, two successes. Yeah, you're not seeing any diseases, no pathogens, no toxins, nothing of that nature. Well, the thing I was scanning for was uh, if there oh, was right, like the an mood increase chemicals. in like ser increase of serotonin and adrenaline rush, you know, if things have become chemically imbalanced. Um, I would say that there is perhaps some indication that there is, uh, for example, I don't know if anyone's been to a place like uh, Colorado, but the higher you go up in the mountain, the thinner the air gets. So there's, I think it's less oxygen in the, in the bloodstream. Something similar here where, you know, maybe not enough oxygen is coming through. So you're kind of getting that high altitude, quote unquote, sickness, but without the sickness part. Uh, current scans are reading possible altitude sickness with low oxygen in the air. I would suggest that everybody maintains a steady breath. <laughs> um, Alel will like furrow her brow and she'll go <sighs> like very pointedly. And then she'll see zero and be like, zero, I... I have to talk to you. I've been meaning to talk to you, actually. I'm sorry For about being mean to you. There has been a time where you were mean? Yeah. You know, where you, like, basically handed me a book and you were like, here's all you need to know about your job. I did but not. You're, you're kind of right. I mean, it's it's fine. I just want to tell you, I'm sorry for being mean to you. So I'm sorry if I did something to admit to elicit a, such a response. Oh, but totally fine. It sounds like we're good. And she'll try and link arms with you and walk Com towards the direction. Com Commander Rast, you said that we've got some some potential humanoids that away so here's what i propose let's sort of 
spread ourselves out a little bit to, to cast a wider net. Um, Commander Vassar and I will, will, will sort of take this general direction. Uh, Cartwright and, and Zero can take sort of this general direction and, and, and you and LL can just head straight ahead. And then if we'll... I may. Yeah. I'm going to spend some thread here that as you're talking about this, Brast, based on your earlier success, you're now hearing those voices again. Like the hundreds of voices, or as you put it, children clamoring for your attention. And as you start to try and focus or maybe push it away, what happens is all of you begin to see forms materializing on this idyllic landscape. And they are exact matches for what uh, Chahal showed you earlier. They are, in fact, demons of some variety. And there is uh -oh. one for each of you. Uh, Zero's going to pick up a rock and throw it at the closest one. <laughs> 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 all right Fezzik right. <laughs> and we're me? actually going to take our 10 minute break there and we will get to the rock throwing when we return so we'll be back in 10 minute stream stick around
So welcome back, everybody, to uh, part two of season three, episode five. If you're just tuning in, well, let's put it this way. The away team has arrived on Ashgrave 4, where there has been uh, sightings of demons, quote unquote. Oh my gosh. And the away team is currently in almost the uh, precipice of a valley. Uh, they are on the top of a rolling green hill with purple flowers that sort of descends down into a, a, the valley itself. And in the distance, you see uh, towards the west where Rast initially thought he sensed the presence of other humanoids. Um, there are mountain ranges and other sorts of greenery, like actual trees rather than just grass and flowers, etc., etc. Um but the problem is the demons that have appeared. They are downslope from you, about, we'll say, 50 meters away. And they're just sort of standing there. They're not really making any motions to attack you. Uh, but I believe, Zero, you were going to throw a rock all the same. So that's going to be a control and a security difficulty of two. And um, GM, while he does that, uh, Williams will look to Lieutenant Cartwright and say, Lieutenant, ready phasers. Yes, sir, of course. And he would move to interpose himself between the away team, halfway between them and the demons. Okay. What? No, there's a rule. Yeah. We have to talk first. We can't do this. We ha we can't fight them. He said ready phasers. I didn't say fire phasers. <sighs> hey, two successes. So... <laughs> Zero, you sling the rock at one of the demons. It sort of pings it in the side of the temple, and the rock just drops to the ground, and the demon just sort of continues sit sitting there menacingly. Basar is rapidly taking as many different spectra scans as he possibly can. So I have good news and bad news. Which I would, would like you the like? bad news first. Bad news. They only show up on the visual spectrum. No infrareds, no x-rays, no organics. Nope. No electromagnetic uh, beams, any kind of interference externally, internally. Nope. No thermal readings concentrating from this. The, okay. That's all the questions that I get. Yeah. But uh, the good Rast, news... Rast will step forward and say, hello. All right. How close do you get out of curiosity? Um... He's going to, you know, break social distancing. Okay. Whoa. Old. Yeah. So you get up close to one of the demons, and it does look down at you, because, again, it's two and a half meters tall, so it's pretty damn tall. Uh, it looks down at you, and for a moment, uh, you look back up at it, and you're not sure if the smoldering eyes, the burning eyes of this creature, are staring into your very soul. But then in a voice... Uh, that all of you understand. It says, You are new. What do you believe? Believe. You have to be more specific. All the people here believe in something. So I ask again, what is it that you believe? I believe in the in, in the power of the individual and the power of of also uh, I also believe in the power of cooperation. And it sort of tilts its head to the side. And I do apologize. Someone is setting off fireworks. So if my dog comes running in here, um, <laughs> but uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. If you see a 120 pound Akita leap at me and I go down, somebody call an ambulance because I ain't getting back up. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the creature actually looks past you at this point, Rast, and looks over the other parts of the away team. And this is just a general question. Of the away team, who would say that they are the most religious? I would imagine that would actually be Cartwright, because Hydrans believe that every single person, family, ship, squadron has a god or a series of gods. So there are tens of thousands, millions of gods in the Hydran Pantheon. Okay. So, as the demon's gaze fixes on Cartwright, 
Um, maybe tell us a little, what does what a god to uh, Cartwright look like? Are they still humanoid? Are they floating spaghetti monsters? You know, what, what, what does a god look like to Cartwright? Um, the gods would be uh, generally hydrant in appearance, uh, but sort of resplendent in their appearance, uh, radiant, kind of angelic. There'd be this uh, uh, sort of angelic aura about them. Okay. So... Before your very eyes, the demon that was talking, it begins to shift. And after a moment, you all are not presented with a demon, but with what is essentially an angel. Just a vague humanoid figure made out of pure energy. And it has uh, wings, again, made out of that same energy. And to Cartwright, it looks like one of the gods. I'm going to presume that you are not actually one of the gods of the Fenrir, given that I just saw you transform from some sort of demonic apparition. And the creature turns back to Rast and says, that one believes. And they shift back into the quote-unquote demon form. Do you understand? He's going to try to reach into its mind. Okay. It's going to be another control command, a uh, difficulty of three this time. Control command. I'm going to use uh, one of those wonderful things there. Mm -hmm. oh. Very nice. Four successes, which means you get the momentum right back. So yeah, Rast, when you reach out with your mind... You again hear that sort of children clamoring for you, but it's more focused now. You're able to pick out individual voices within the clamoring, and you realize that each of the demon creatures is actually just a gestalt consciousness. This is the same sort of being just manifesting in copies of itself. You are an interesting entity, my friend. And if there was a belief that I'd follow, um, there was a short, um, there was a short experiment called the science of the mind. Kind of tilts its head on Earth. Can't say I'm familiar with this experiment. It was more of a spiritual, uh, philosophical, uh, philosophical movement. Hmm. Well, I have appeared before you because there is a problem. And what is that problem? I have done my best over the years to be what the planet's inhabitants require of me. Gods, angels, demons. But lately, there have been more demons in people's thoughts. Thus, I must manifest as demons. You do not have such thoughts. I do not. We would like your assistance with this matter. Humanoids are demon enough for me. We appear before you to tell you this. If you are unable to get the inhabitants to cease viewing us as demons, gods, whatever, we will unfortunately cease to exist in approximately two days' time. And is it, is it just the general populace that is starting to view you this way? Correct. Where do you exist from? It sort of opens its arms wise and motions around at the valley and the greenery and says, we are all things here. Did you Man. have a beginning? Not that I'm aware of. 
So if we were merely to remove the colonists from this planet, would you go back to the prior state that you existed in before their arrival, or would you also cease to exist? Uh, forgive me, I'm not sure about the the technicalities of this situation and why it is that you're going to dissipate. I will dissipate because I will have to go to war with myself. And it's almost as if to, to sort of highlight their point, about half the demons become sort of angel-like again, and they start, like, making motions of attacking each other. But then the one that's speaking sort of furrows the brow, and the eyes smolder a bit brighter, and they all go back to being demons. Even now, it's hard to keep control of myself. Does so the recorder of... record any of this audible exchange? Yes, yes it does. Excellent. So the manifestations then have to to at, at least some degree follow the way that those who perceive them believe they will behave. An angel will fight a demon and vice versa. Thus, you would be diminished. Correct, yes. There is a belief called Ragnarok where the angels and demons annihilate one another. And that is what will happen in two days' time. Who is an Anala? I do not know this Anala. What you're saying is that you're essentially suffering from some kind of war within your own psyche. You, the two bifurcated portions of your own mind are threatening to destroy each other, the yin and the yang, the dark and the light of your, of your own consciousness. Is there any way for us, rather than to remove the influence of the individuals on this planet, to instead somehow unify these two aspects of your own personality through some kind of psychotherapy? This is not my area of expertise, Dr. Ladell, but... Um... <sighs> um... I, just an idea. I don't know. I'm sorry. Commander Fassar, maybe this is a, a matter of, uh, for a man of science rather than the good doctor. Due to the nature of the inhabitants' beliefs in these entities or this entity, I do not believe psychotherapy would be well received. Perhaps some form of ritual designed to encourage the believers to wish this entity well so that it may find peace within itself again. It's di difficult for me to even know where to start because there's no readings coming off of these creatures or this entity. They, they are a manifestation of belief. They are a manifestation of, for lack of a better term, wishes. It, is there a way that we could potentially utilize propaganda to get people to believe the result that this entity itself wishes to wishes to experience. Commander Rest, I do not believe propaganda is necessary, as I was able to record the audible exchange between you and the entity detailing its wishes. Andrew, <sighs> if I may. The idea of this consciousness along with the populace itself generating it it leads me to have to pull up reports from Chief O'Brien on his time on Deep Space Nine where he had to take part in telling a story that allowed the emotions and effects of the people in unison to not only fight off a sort of impending doom. Um, the other thing that I find strange is the demon itself declared that it would have to perform a Ragnarok. The irony I currently see within that statement is our ship is the Fenrir and the old Norse and the old human uh, Norse, pay, or Norse heathenistic belief is that Fenrir upon being released from his chains shall devour the sun and that is the beginning of Ragnarok where the gods fight amongst themselves and amongst those demons of that religion 
However, at the end of the fight, several members of the Veneer and Asia do create a new idyllic world once Yggdrasil is reborn, the world tree of the nine realms. Well, I believe the first people that we need to talk to are probably the people to the west, the representatives of this voice of purity. Maybe we can get them to see reason. You humans have such a, a quaint and, well, quite frankly, cute little mythology. It's so simplistic. <laughs> and what I would say yeah. is that as this exchange is happening, uh, the demons have actually begun to disappear. Just one by one, they're beginning to sort of Thanos themselves out of reality. Okay, so he said, or they said, two days. Yes, and the uh, the people that we wish to see are less than a kilometer to the west. Interrogative. Another statement that was made that I have just finished processing is the demon stated that they are everything. Is it possible this world could be akin to Ryza, where it was created and there is now a higher being or maybe some form of AI that is keeping this world together than perhaps the creators of this world left or, or, on, or no longer came back and after it be, was found, the various conflicting beliefs have now caused it to become, to resort to the state that it's currently at. You raise an interesting proposition. Not unlike the entity the USS Enterprise D encountered at Farpoint Station that had been subjugated to provide for the inhabitants of that colony. Zero, I will scan like the grass in the surrounding area to see if it reads the same as the demons or not. A insight and science. Actually, let's do reason science. Uh, reason science difficulty of four. And you may have one other person assist you. That's very interesting because I was going to have Vassar contact Lieutenant Junior Grade Rawl aboard the Fenrir, who is a science officer with a focus in sensors to conduct a sensor analysis of the area. We could handle and it, but... <laughs> he's up there, too. Uh, yes. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Lee, would you be able to provide a sensor analysis of our immediate area within a range of three kilometers? Uh, is there anything in particular that you'd like me to scan for, Lieutenant Bain? Uh I am sending you a detailed uh, record of a recent tricorder log uh, and to see if you can sense any fleeting quantum particulate in the area. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to pick up any readings beyond the visual spectrum for the entities that appeared just prior to my calling you. Hmm. Sounds like I'm missing one hell of an away mission. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, I will attempt to, unless uh, Lieutenant Raul, was it, wanted to assist with that? I will uh, scan. Right. Uh, so could I take some time to review the various different mission specifications from et cetera, et cetera, to use mental repository? Yep. OK. And then reason science? Mm-hmm. Uh, augmented as, ability. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to reply as an assist to uh, zeros. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, or would it be better for him to do it than I feed information from the planet itself? So I would be assisting him. Yeah, why don't we do it that way where you're assisting him? Okay. Um, I'll buy an extra die. Okay. And uh, I'll actually tap a value 
um, which okay. is the prophets created this universe for us to uh, to explore. All right, yeah, that would definitely apply here. So two momentum for an extra die, and the yeah. uh, focal focus. And if we're using the ship sensors, oh! does Fenrir oh. roll? Uh, Fenrir doesn't need to roll because you're already capped on momentum, uh, and you're so far capped on momentum by my count that you basically have four floating before even the Fenrir or zero rolls. Ask all the questions. <laughs> I mean, we can go ahead and roll and just have extra momentum. It's up to you. We just use that floating <laughs> momentum to eliminate threat. Or extra complications. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's the fun part. So, Lee, what you're seeing on your scan is that... Yeah, now that you know what to look for, there is a very... How do I put this in a way that makes sense in Technobabble? You know how everything has a quantum signature? And I'm not just talking like, hey, you know, this universe quantum signature is this universe's quantum signature, you know, something like that. It's more of... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not explaining this. Let me, let me back up here. It's almost like being given a Petri dish and told that you're to find the human in it. And what you're seeing are building blocks that might build up to a human. So you might see amoebas, you might see skin cells, you might see muscle tissue, you might see maybe some fragments of bone. And now that you are looking for the quote-unquote full human, you're seeing the pieces for that, but you don't have the full picture, if that makes sense. Uh, Lieutenant Commanders Vassar and Zero, I'm forwarding you all the sensor data that I can acquire from these scans, I think based on your position on the planet, you might be able to put this to better use and, well, interpret it better than I can. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. Uh, we'll be welcome. standing by for communicating in the future. Very good. So, uh, Fenrir out. And right as you do Fenrir out, the Fenrir rocks and red alert begins to sound. As Lee, you're seeing that the sun of the plant or the sun of the system has begun to enter into what is essentially a mini supernova or the process of a supernova. Can I ascertain how long it's going to take for the process to actually reach critical? Two days. <laughs> okay, there's something fishy going on around here. Commodore, we have two days to evacuate this entire colony before that sun goes nova. Uh, was this the natural course of events? Can you tell if this was artificially induced? Could I take a scan of the sun to see if uh, what might have triggered this rapid evolution in its uh, sort of uh, its lifespan? Yeah, uh, I would say that would be a let's call this an insight science. Uh, let's do this at a difficulty of three. Okay. And can uh, the ship assist? Uh, the ship may assist with computers and science. Not a sensor science? Um, I'd say this is more computers trying to churn the sensor data. I'll buy two extra dice. Okay. For three momentum, if that's all right with everyone. And did you say the ship always has a focus? Ship always has a focus, yep. Oh, wow. God. Wow. What is going on? <laughs> wow. Something is fishy. That's, All the uh, alpha particles are spinning clockwise. Yeah, that is uh, eight successes. So again, you're <laughs> capped on momentum. Do so, we know, uh, out of character, sorry, yes. how many colonists are on the. Yes, the you know planet? that there are about 2,000. Okay. Um, but yeah, Lee, what you're seeing is that just before the sun started to sort of go supernova, quote-unquote, a metallic object flew into the corona and basically merged with the sun. Well, Captain, uh, or forgive me, Commodore, it does seem like this was an unnatural occurrence. Some kind of object entered into the sun. I, I speculate that it's some kind of weapon that's been designed to actually destabilize the core of a, a star and, well, trigger this rapid evolution in its life cycle. And it's likely irreversible. 
is is there any way do I detect something that would allow me to well first of all with the first flowing momentum mm -hmm. and I get a sensor reading of the device prior to its detonation is there any indication as to who created it yes and the answer to that is it is a tholian design tholians okay mm. How far from Tholian space are we currently? You are literally on the other side of the expanse from Tholian space. What? So, in fact, uh, let's actually go to that map so I can show you where you guys are. Uh, oh so, boy. let's see. So, you are about here, uh, here at E1. Uh, Tholian space is all the way down here in... Uh, basically C6. So you are literally across the quadrant from Tholian space right now. So that was my first free question. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'd be happy to solicit other questions from anyone else here as well. But the other question I would have would be, is there some kind of chronometric signature on the device that would suggest it was not sent from our own time or when it was created? Yes. The date comes from the 29th century. Tholians. Okay. But uh, as you all are debating how to handle this situation, let's go ahead and call this episode to a close. Let's end on a cliffhanger. What? Oh. Mm, okay. <sighs> And I do that for two reasons. One, it's a good cliffhanger. And two, my dog is literally flipping all the, oh. the problems right now. And I need to deal with the Akita before she tears things apart. Um, so I do apologize for the shorter session. But hopefully it was a good cliffhanger to end on. Hopefully you guys had fun. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where I'm going to end the stream. So Twitch YouTube, thank you so much. And later stream. Okay.